Great to see you all. Well, um, let's let's jump into it. Um, thank you all for joining us today uh, for one of many exciting events hosted by the Communication Design Program here at Texas State University. Um, I'm Alice Lee, and um, I'd like to introduce Molly Sherman. We are both assistant professors of communication design here at Texas State, and we're both graduate co-advisors for the MFA program. Uh, we'd also like to thank Michael Niblett, I'm so sorry, Michael, Michael Niblett, uh, the director of, school, uh, um, of the School of Art and Design, and all the faculty, staff, and students in our school for their continued support. Some logistics, we ask that you mute your audio to limit interruptions and distractions. Uh, you're welcome to, but not expected to, to turn off your video. Uh, we do ask that you turn it on if you feel comfortable during the Q&A portion um, later. Uh, we are recording this event and we'll be sharing the recording on the Texas State Communication Design YouTube channel. Uh, now I'd like to introduce uh, Alicia and Sarah um, they are partners at uh, MGMT Design, Management Design, a collaborative woman-owned graphic design studio founded in 2003 and based in Brooklyn. Uh, MGMT has extensive experience in print, branding, exhibition, and environmental design, information, and web design. As a collaborative studio, uh, MGMT's design's prevailing approach is to place investigation and process ahead of a single design aesthetic. Approaching all projects with initial research and maintaining a level of conceptual rigor throughout the process, they search for smart and responsive design solutions that visually enrich the content. Um, they have received awards from the Society of Environmental Graphic Designers, Print Magazine Design Annual, AIGA, the Art Directors Club, uh, the American Society of Magazine Editors and ID Magazine. Both Alicia and Sarah received their MFAs from Yale University. And so it's with great pleasure and honor to uh, turn it over to Alicia and Sarah. Hi, I am Sarah and this is Alicia for Management Design. And this is that, this is me. Sarah Gephardt. And that's me, is Alicia Chang. And our studio is in Brooklyn, New York. Um, so Alice said some of the projects we work on, these are some of the clients that we generally work with. We work with architects and museums, nonprofits, for-profits, magazines, publishers. We do a range of work. Um, from print, exhibition, and web identity. Um, that's who we generally say we work with. And then there's that whole uh, other realm that we don't always advertise. Um, architects we share space with, elementary school book fairs, good causes with no money. Um, we like doing a lot of work and we work on a range of projects. So. Tonight, we're gonna to show you a couple projects, some of our work and some of our side work that we do to keep us sustained. So the first project we're going to show is a project in Bangkok and Alicia is gonna work us through this. Yeah, we're just gonna go back and forth and just show some samples of our work. And uh, we just wanna uh, thank you guys at uh, Texas State for having us and also sympathize with your uh, electrical and water issues. And I'm glad that everyone seemed to be able to restabilize enough to tune in on a Friday night to graphic design talks. Yeah, so definitely. We are Thank you all. <laughs> and uh, we'll start with something very fancy, just so I hope it makes it worth your while um, for a project we did in Bangkok, Thailand for the queen of Thailand. Cue next slide. Um, mm -hmm. This is a portrait of her when she was young. Um, so these kind of projects literally happen with a phone call. Um, it was an architect who was based in New York who asked if we'd be interested in working for the Queens Museum. And he failed to mention anything beyond that. And I thought it was a um, museum in Queens, New York, which it was not. Uh, it turned out to be the Queen of Thailand who was looking to basically create a new museum in honor of her good works uh, for different native crafts, one of which would be textiles. So it was an exciting opportunity, a new collaboration with a team that was primarily uh, based in New York and San Francisco. Um, so we found ourselves visiting on site. It was um, 
actually a location that was had not been used for the public, but it was on the site of the Grand Palace, which these are some photos from that. So if anybody has been there, it's an incredibly uh, rich cultural heritage, a lot of deep ornamentation uh, and sort of layers of incredibly rich and opulent, uh, especially in the Grand Palace um, kind of features. Uh, if we go to the next one, just sort of ornamentation that happens from really the ground that you walk on to the very tops of the rooftops. Uh, so all around, which is incredibly stimulating and immersive. And the very first couple of visits we had were, you know, really getting to know the conditions by which this museum would live and the content that they were showing, such that we were given very um, amazing co comprehensive tours of, um, you know, villagers doing artisanal work in terms of how they nurtured the silk and wove the silk and dyed the silk. Um, and then also demonstrations of different techniques for dyeing um, that range from ikat and different techniques that were specific to Southeast Asia and those that were also specific to Thailand. So it was also, it was about that aspect of sort of the folkloric uh, approach to textile making, but it was also to celebrate the queen and her fashion sense, which wasn't really uh, highlighted in the brief per se, but it sort of became a clear mandate as we in in embarked on the project. So uh, within that grand palace, you have this rather grandiose um, entryway for the museum. It was a converted military barracks. Um, so the local architect there really made it in this model sort of neoclassical um, uh, grand uh, museum language. So this is a shot it's still under construction, uh, but some features there. Uh, and basically we were tasked uh, with the um, identity of the museum and also doing the exhibition graphics uh, for the permanent collection and the temporary exhibitions that were gonna be debuted with the opening of the museum. So this is a, a image of the original artwork we were provided by the Royal family as the queen's seal that needed to be integrated into whatever identity we created, which also had to be bilingual. Um, but the seal, we were taking a close look at it, wondering where we could, um, you know, stylize it in such a way that it could be a little bit more integrated with whatever we were um, concocting. So we were developing um, studies in terms of that artwork, as well as looking closely at the Thai uh, typography. So we commissioned a Thai typography a typographer to do some investigations. I confess I had uh, immediate aspirations to learn the language back and forth, but um, didn't happen. Uh, but turns out a lot of people, uh, other people know Thai, uh, so that was helpful for proofreading especially. Um, we're gonna cut to the chase and just show you the final uh, results, which was uh, the seal, which we actually had to use more in its original form with some minor tweaks, which you won't be able to necessarily discern here, um, paired with um, Jonathan Hoffler's uh, Requiem typeface, um, and then played a lot with the sort of um, the Thai concurrent text. So uh, that's fine. So that was the final process. And then it was a, a process by which we then gave the identity and all its component uh, parts and a very comprehensive brand and style guides to the museum to implement such that every time we came back every, I think it was every month or so, uh, you know, new things would appear like this signage on the facade, which, you know, looks great. It was nothing we, we had to design ourselves. Uh, but then we would notice that in the, in the lobby, uh, would be, you know, the intro text that we did typeset, but sort of on marble and infill, very, very high end craftsmanship um, and kind of nice as to sort of see it come to life uh, before our eyes. And so then, you know, so too, we set up like the template for the signage, which was then implemented by them locally. Um, and then the exhibition itself, which, uh, you know, pretty straightforward intro text here. This was all in English, um, but the, the text panels were all in Thai as well. Um, and it was very, just a beautiful casework to display uh, the really amazing hand, uh, handicraft with, with a lot of these um, outfits that were all worn by the queen for different royal events, et cetera. Um, so the casework was done in Italy. It was very no expense spared kind of thing. Um, and, you know, they had like lenticular uh, film on some of the cases to sort of reveal uh, the outfits behind. Um, and other, you know, sort of parade of different mannequins. There was one point where all the mannequins were arrayed in the lobby. So you had the queen sort of shape in different periods of her life, which was kind of uh, hilarious. But um, the royal, having the cl uh, a client as a royal family was really 
a very serious situation for them and they were also undergoing a lot of political upheaval. So it was a very um, complex project to navigate in terms of uh, the scope, but also uh, the culture and the sort of the interpersonal aspects that evolved. And this was, it took, I think, I don't know, Sarah, two or three years at least in development. Yeah. Uh, you know, because we're graphic designers, we care about things like the labels. You won't necessarily see shots of that for exhibitions, but um, you know, how you can uh, easily identify multiple things in one case uh, and sort of navigate with the next slide, just sort of the bilingual aspect too and the line breaks, which were tricky to, to maneuver. Um, with the brand identity too, it, it came with a lot of different patterns and we displayed in the style guides a really rigorous application of those speculatively but uh, we were really happy to see that the people in retail really knew how to get the job done and sort of created all these different um, uh, merchandise items that reflected uh, our identity in a really uh, um, loyal way. So it was just really nice to sort of see it like as an umbrella, as a bookmark um, and all these different kind of like post-it notes. So that was kind of nice. Uh, I think that's the end of this one. Right. So we go from, you know, the royalty of Thailand to um, a women's prison. So this project is uh, about the women's building, but it's about how a client project then sort of turns into uh, the next part, uh, generates big questions in the whole process of working for them, which then uh, enables us to sort of think more about these big questions and figure out uh, how to express them, you know, independent of the, of the actual brief. But it involved like researching as a group involving the whole studio, which then we result in what we are calling uh, collaborative digressions. So just to say, including a project like this, um, you know, there are a lot of different portfolio presentations, but we wanted to show you something that sort of was the client project that led to something that became much more uh, owned by uh, us as a studio collectively and us individually as uh, individual designers. So it started with a phone call from a place called the Novo Foundation, uh, which is a foundation established by, it's Warren Buffett's uh, uh, son and daughter-in-law. Um, but they were looking for designers to help them transform this building, which is located in New York in sort of the Chelsea Arts District. Um, they wanted to uh, repurpose it into a headquarters for girls and women's activism and uh, social justice. Uh, the building itself um, was built in 1931 as a hotel and a YMCA for sailors. So you see the sort of Siemens house signage on the right. Um, it was a drug rehab center in the 60s. And then it served as a, the Bayview Correctional Facility, which was a women's prison for over 30 years. So it was a prison until our, we had a huge storm here called Superstorm Sandy in 2012. Um, which devastated the building and caused the evacuation. And so it had been empty until we visited with a small group uh, uh, after the sometime after the storm. So the building, this image shows a sort of chapel, but it had a lot of period details and mosaics. Uh, there was like a gym and a pool, not in, the gym was in use sort of, but the pool was built over. Um, so there was you know, vestiges of this seafaring past, as well as very grim artifacts of the lives of the inmates. Um, you know, as I said, the location was smack in the middle of this very fancy arts district, which had a lot of, you know, big fancy recreational facilities too. So these windows looked out onto sort of very high end teeming New York life, which was particularly poignant. Um, so it was a very unusual brief, let's put it that way. And the process by which we worked with the client, uh, but the client itself represented a lot of different stakeholders who were also actively involved in a very first person way. Uh, we're talking not just sort of the marketing person, because this wasn't a normal project where they were trying to advertise for it. They weren't trying to get people into the building. They really wanted it to be an honest and true reflection of their intentions uh, as a foundation to really serve um, a demographic that needed to be as inclusive as possible. So the process did involve post-its, it always did, but like lots of workshopping, feedback from a range of different constituencies. There was victims of domestic abuse, indigenous peoples groups, there was um, advocates for uh, prison reform. It was a really impressive range of people that we wanted to work with and give feedback for. Normally, if you talk about a normal brand exercise, that amount of stakeholders and voices involved is kind of a nightmare and you don't want it. But we realized that this project really benefited from many voices, not in unison, uh, but just sort of hearing the feedback and the perspectives of everybody. 
So all of this led to big questions we were asking ourselves and of the project. In terms of like branding something like this, you know, could one symbol really reflect who they were as a collective group? And then after that, how could one identity reflect a living model of collective values that didn't sort of box it in and sort of stamp it as a normal sort of brand can typically do? Um, other questions being, how could it be participatory and inclusive in a direct way? You know, people like to say that the graphic designers are the ones that pick the typography. What happens if we open that up a little bit and allowed for fundamental tools to be used for anybody who walked in? How democratic is too democratic? Um, so these are really meaty questions that we were chewing on along with, you know, running different workshops and exercises with these different stakeholders, asking them to say, draw diagrams of different proportions of different subjects that they, they wanted to see addressed with the programmatic uh, planning but also at the same time doing a bit of research in terms of what these forms were starting to make us think about in terms of different ways where things were connecting. So we all kept drawing these circles and we did a number of different um, directions, but we're gonna hone in on, on the one that was selected. But the circle direction really became uh, an evolution of recognizing that each circle were, could represent a group, an issue, uh, a thought, but every time it overlapped, the nexus itself was the women's building. Uh, and the circles, we didn't want to get too balled up in any kind of quantitative representation, but just have had that feeling that it was sort of dynamic, but also consistent. So we had to sort of lock in sort of like simpler to more complex um, identities as our sort of different usable states. And this is uh, showing some color studies that we had, but then sort of figure out ways where it could animate um, and sort of be as a sort of dynamic quality, um, you know, within a logo with the, the type being static. Um, you know, of course you do have your tote bags and your merch that everyone can uh, see it as sort of app applied. I think that's the next slide. Yeah. Do that. Um, oh no, I think yeah. so, yeah, we show it. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Show it environmentally with the architect's renderings. Um, and then, you know, when it became down to different ways where it could manifest, um, you know, the tote bag, but also the most gratifying was sort of seeing it deployed on the people it was meant for. So we had a lot of different um, sort of public events. Uh, this was one sort of block party that we did and then another um, in the pride parade. And, you know, fundamentally not so complex in terms of the graphical design, but the process by which this uh, was embraced and owned by the group was really a singular experience and one that I hope everyone is, is newly uh, born designers can can seek out because it really is quite gratifying in terms of that level of community engagement and communication, uh, which, you know, sometimes can weigh out out proportion the actual graphical design that gets produced. Um, so then just to say those projects and those questions that came up, we had still further questions uh, that were, you know, in terms of the women's building and those aspects, those questions of gender. Uh, what role does gender play in design? And, you know, we were just sort of bandying around these ideas uh, but then also we were asking what role does gender play in typography? And, you know, we weren't seeking to answer this question, but we were sort of exploring that area around between these words and just sort of see what happens. Um, and it was something that, you know, you can easily just sort of ask them and sort of go on your way and sort of keep plugging away at work. But it was just kind of a nice open discussion that we were having. And so we started pinning things up on the wall that was sort of inspiring again in and around this subject matter. Um, and another one of our designers was sort of doing this diagram, you know, what is a, a gender fluid typography look like, you know, is a sans serif always male or is a, you know, a script more female. So, you know, how do you create a non-binary typeface? Is there such a thing? Like we were sort of uh, banding these questions around in the studio and then there's other sketches that we were making just for fun. Uh, but it was a great uh, sort of common thing to have our brains chew on. And, you know, it's also a great, uh, not an excuse, but uh, uh, we would do group, um, group field trips to do research. And we're super inspired by this show that was at the Met Breuer at the time of a Brazilian um, artist named Ligia Pape, P-A-P-E. I really recommend looking at her work. She was a female Brazilian artist who was um, in sort of modern art movement uh, in the sort of 60s, 70s. And she worked during a really repressive military dictatorship at, um, in uh, Brazil. So she created this piece of social sculpture, she called it, um, called Divisor, where the individuals would walk with their heads poking their uh, through a holes in a sheet, moving sort of as one unit. And this was also very inspiring to us. 
uh, quite literally. So we sort of uh, had fun sort of doing this type of um, test drive. But just to say that this kind of thing, as kind of jokey as this is, oh, this is slow motion for us, um, <laughs> was really a, a direct metaphor of what we wanted to produce for the building. Like something that was living and dynamic, but sort of unified, but sort of went as a whole, but still had independent agency to some degree. Um, so then we basically, then of course, you know, trying to organize ourselves was a bit tricky, but we uh, developed, you know, 10 minutes each person uh, that we presented at a friend's gallery one night to a lot of beer and a bunch of friends where Ian, one of our designers presented an analysis of um, 100 romance novels uh, and discussed the relationship of genre and gender. Uh, he hand drew, uh, hand trace all of these, just sort of looking at the typographic composition and sort of got very philosophical as he uh, was talking about the analysis of the romance, uh, romance novel um, genre. And then Fede did um, a discourse on language, color and uh, personal history. I really can't explain it more than that. It was very meditative and beautiful and like quite a departure. But you know, basically as you guys are working in your thesis land of MFA-ness, it was really giving people room to explore, you know, you could call it a thesis, but you didn't have to worry so much about the critical uh, reception. You were just allowed to sort of free form it uh, based on a common prompt. Uh, and then uh, let's see, Mo and I did um, an exploration of sort of how uh, typographic forms could be generated from uh, random forms and had everyone sort of create an alphabet uh, on site while they were in attendance. Uh, which leads us to Sarah, who will discuss her hypothetical hack of our glyph system. Great. So yeah, I'm gonna go a little more in depth now just on my project. Um, so I called it a hypothetical hack, um, but that sort of came at the end. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit through my process on the research and what I was thinking about. Um, in the fall of 2006, Apple released the iOS 10 update, which introduced um, the emoji replacement and emoji prediction functions. So now that as we type along, if you have this open, emojis are automatically suggested to finish our sentences. Um, so for instance, when typing CEO, the acronym can be replaced by the image of well, a male in a, um, <clears throat> in a suit. And so the website Mashable noticed this with an article in 2017. And they noticed that even if you type a, a female pronoun in the sentence that you're composing, such as he's the, she's the CEO, the male figure would be suggested. And after I read the article, I tested it and I got that same result. Um, but then a few weeks after, the up, after that, I read that, I updated and it fixed it. So then when I typed, I think you'll make a great CEO to Alicia, I was given two icon options, either a male or a female. So um, today there are many, many icon, emoji icon options for a whole range of professions and for both genders and in a whole range of skin tones. Um, so it still is perpetuating that gender binary, but at least we're headed in the right direction. Um, to counter this gender binary issue, the designer Paul Hunt proposed balancing, add, to, proposed adding in some gender neutral icons. And these are the ones that he introduced, like a kid icon, a medium aged one, and an older gender neutral icon. And as he, uh, I talked to him about these, and he was talking about how hard it is to um, design when you're working with so many, so few pixels and you're dealing with stereotypes um, because here we're back to that creepy CEO guy. Um, stereotypes are there for a reason and therefore notoriously hard to break. The reasons for the implicitly predictive male CEO icon back in the day could have been due to patterns in the writer's own messaging or because the Unicode symbol the Unicode number for a man's face is lower than the number for a woman's or because the designer who originated the code simply thought of a CEO as naturally male or thought that a male figure could represent a neutral figure much as how he has been used as a universal pronoun for decades. And much has been written about how machine learning and predictive technology can emphasize latent prejudices 
So as I was thinking about that and reading these articles, um, they struck me as relevant in light of our gender and typography project. So, you know, well, tools of communication um, from the quill to letterpress to telephones and computers um, are typically gendered. The biases are inherent in the production of the society over time. So here we have this um, six cylinder printing press being run by um, some men. And here we have that classic stereotypical image of telephone, female telephone operators. Um, so while these images are not surprising, what is startling is um, that biases in communication today are almost more damaging than they were in the past because of this black box in which many programmatic decisions are being made without us being, without us seeing them. Um, so for my project for the group talk, I developed what I call the hypothetical hack, the proposal to utilize the ability of technology to force change. And with that, the potential of typography to precede spoken language in forming new words. And as a place to start, I decided to focus on the idea of designing a gender neutral pronoun glyph. And as I was working through the project, three sort of models came to light for me that worked like cookie crumbs uh, directing my path. So the first is the ampersand. Uh, the form is derived from the Latin et et for and, but its name actually came after the initial use of the glyph itself, the name ampersand. Um, the et origins are sort of more visible here you see in the italic version. Um, it was first found in graffiti from Pompeii when a hasty ligature was created combining the letters. It was further developed and established during the Renaissance when um, type was being developed. And the ET ligature remained even when language moved away from Latin and forged into many different languages, the, the symbol stayed. Um, the glyphs use it was so common at one point that it was considered the 27th letter of the alphabet and British school children reciting the letters would end with X, Y, Z and per se and since per se means by and of itself. So what the students were saying was X, Y, Z and by itself and. And over time that phrase and per se and was mixed into a single word ampersand, which is cool in itself. So while the ampersand lost out in being part of our alphabet. It has um, evolved in many into many different typefaces. And here's an example from uh, Jan Chikold's it's a brief history of the ampersand. Um, and it's very beautiful form. So the second cookie crumb that I came across was the honorific Ms. And here it is in the logo of Ms. Magazine. Um, the history of honorifics, miss, misses, and ms are kind of muddled. At one point in the past, misses was used regardless of marital status, like way back in the past, it was used regardless of marital status, just as an honorific of someone of importance. And then over time, it became codified that misses was someone who was married and miss was someone who was unmarried. Um, around 1900, someone discovered, there's an article written, um, in the Springfield Times, um, where it was suggesting to use Ms. when you didn't know those embarrassing moments when you don't know whether a woman is married or not. It was largely ignored. This, that was just like uncovered by a writer from the New York Times. But, but in the 60s and 70s, it was picked up again by feminists who were rejecting this notion that their marital status was part of their name. So it became this sort of this rallying cry for women. And then it was picked up by Gloria Steinem to be the name of her um, feminist magazine, Ms. <clears throat> um, and the magazine was introduced in 1971. At the time, though, the pronunciation was still sort of up in the air. Was it Ms. or was it Ms. or something like that? So it sort of like developed over time. It was sort of like the symbol came before the pronunciation. Um, my third example is this, and I say, it's obvious what it is, but I'm realizing like, does everyone know? <laughs> this is the symbol Prince developed for uh, when he wanted to break away from Warner Brothers. Um, so he said, my name is no longer Prince, I am this. 
uh, it caused kind of an uproar because there was no word for it. Um, and so he became the artist formerly known as Prince, kind of linguistic um, leap there. Uh, the other problem was, yes, <laughs> how to distribute this. So this is pre-internet times, if you can think back on that. And what they figured out to do was floppy disks with this symbol made as a font was distributed to all these media outlets so that they could use it and print it. So, um, well, it didn't really get them out of the contract. I think there were some, still some legal issues. It did, it was really successful in promoting Prince, his reputation as this gender mending avant-garde performer and the symbol lived on and became, um, developed a name of its own as what's called the love symbol. And so then my last cookie crumb was this, and it was actually an error that happened uh, in an OS upgrade system, happened in, during the time of my research. Um, <clears throat> and Apple had upgraded and was developing a predictive technology and something quirky happened and this glitch came about. Um, and it was me and millions of other people, Apple users, you, using OS 10 and 11, where when we typed I in our messaging, the I was replaced by the letter A and this like odd Unicode symbol. Um, and the bug was related to Apple's cloud-based synchronization predictive text. Um, but for some reason, you didn't know it. It just like that was what happened. It replaced it. And so you would be typing along and you would have sentences like this. Um, semi semionically, I doesn't have to look for, like I for people to understand what you mean. The key in this case was ensuring that enough people using and recognizing the new symbol gave it the same meaning as I. So as the hundreds of millions of people who use iPhones experience the glitch together, it began to enforce a new letter in the alphabet. And once we collectively decided we didn't need I, we adapted and moved on. And our machines had somehow dictated a new language for us and we ran with it. Well, it was fixed. But anyway, this started giving me some ideas. So if you add up <clears throat> these four these four key elements, it, my project seemed kind of obvious. I was going to design a gender neutral pronoun glyph and I was going to hack into Apple and insert a program so that every time someone types he or she, the program autocorrects the sim it to the symbol. So easy. Um, I decided to focus just on the designing the gender neutral glyph. <laughs> um, so I started by drawing as many possibilities of the form as I could think of. And it's tricky territory. So in the most basic, it's just replacing the awkward he or she or the written version S slash he. So these ones are sort of similar to that. And I thought that if <clears throat> the form was somewhat Le legible as a combination of S slash he, it would be more familiar and easier for people to adopt, similar to the ET ligature that Amber singing. And the evocative nature of blending the two letters also seemed appropriate to the task. Like the ampersand too, I thought it should be something that flows from the handwriting. So I was drawing and painting these as I went. Um, <clears throat> the trickier aspect of a pronoun replacement is its use in the gender fluid community where a he, she symbol might superficially fix the binary problem in the gender fluid community, is it possible for a static glyph to represent change at any moment? Or can a symbol, a single symbol represent infinite, infinite individuality? Of course, I don't know this. These are just questions I was thinking about. But as I further worked on it, I was thinking about Ms. as a model and how it, the and word, the honorific sort of preceded how you pronounced it or how everyone agreed to pronounce it. So I was thinking that if I proposed a symbol, then people would coalesce around how they wanted to pronounce it, what the word was, so that it could be sort of evocative of other pronoun options like me or V or E, Z, which are some that are out there, or they too, which is sort of where I think people are coming. Um, <clears throat> but I wanted those to be sort of equally evident in the form. Um, so, and then thinking about Prince's love symbol as a model, I thought perhaps the form could be something completely new and represent this full range of gender possibilities just on its own. 
ideally the glyph would be chosen by consensus um, and not just one person, obviously. And <clears throat> but for the purposes of this talk, I chose just one of the options that seemed the most uh, evocative and did all the things that I wanted to do. So this was the symbol that I sort of landed on. And so the next step would be to program it into the iOS and to hack in and have it be uploaded so that every time you type, he or she replaces. And this is what <clears throat> it would look like. So when Sasha put on the costume, she went outside and Sam was waiting at the restaurant where they worked, however you want to replace it. So eventually, you know, hopefully it becomes like the ampersand and gets transformed into a couple of different fonts. So here's my Helvetica version and my Bedoni version and my Cooper Black version. And just recently, I sort of picked up this project again because I had done this initial work in the past. And I um, realized that instead of waiting for somebody to hack into Apple, I could just design my own font that like ligatures automatically auto corrects he or she to the symbol. Um, so here it is uh, working. I'm still, I'm work, it's in progress, um, but very exciting to be working on. Do you notice how that shelf didn't, the S-H-E didn't convert to the ligature? That's very exciting. I applaud your effort. I know you're very proud of it. I think <laughs> uh, If anyone wants this font, it will be uh, out there soon. Um, so that's really fun. And that was really, you know, helpful for the studio to be doing this sort of outside work project, this independent research project, but, you know, someone has to pay the bill. So we're going to show you some real, some other real client work. Um, about the time that the women's building project was winding down, the National Building Museum in DC gave us a call. Here they are calling us um, to do an exhibition based on Matthew Desmond's book, Evicted. Um, Matthew Desmond is a MacArthur Genius Award winning writer. And he wrote this book where he lived with eight families in Milwaukee for a year. And all the families were in the cusp of or facing eviction. And it's quite devastating narrative and the curator I applaud the curator very much for thinking that this book could be turned into an exhibition. Um, and how do you do that? Well, we worked with the architects. We worked very closely with the curator and with these art with um, architects matter architecture practice um, to turn this into and this book experience into an experiential three dimensional experience. So here you are looking into the exhibition through the doors. And what was really nice at the museum is they showed this exhibition for free for a whole year. Um, so Sandra Wheeler at Matter Architectural Practice um, came up with this solution to sort of divide the exhibition, the content into four sections. And each section was housed in house structure. Um, the houses were shown in sort of disrepair and this uncanny, they were turned inside out. So the wallpaper is on the outside and we left little elements like light switches and light bulbs on the outside. So it's just this feeling of sort of like you're caught off guard. Um, this is the title wall and we took all of the, we found all of these um, eviction notices that are online for free for landlords and we wheat pasted them to the house. And then we used sort of the typography of these authoritarian um, notices as our model for our type. So it's like a condensed sans serif, it's very authoritarian and um, Times New Roman, very bureaucratic. And then interspersed with quotes on the wall. Um, we wanted to do a lot of infographics and three dimension infographics. So you're seeing, you're thinking of the text and seeing it in this new light. And so it has a physical feeling. Um, so this was all of the evictions, I think in 2017, um, over the, in the United States. And so the number was indicated by the size of the boxes. Um, so it had a very aggressive feeling to it. Um, this is looking back on that first house, again, which dealt with the causes of eviction, which is that rents have been rising 
just steadily going up, whereas income has held flat for very long. Um, and just that creates this gap that people can't um, overcome. Um, for mid, like 50, 75% of people who are low income in the low income bracket are paying over 50% of their income for their rent, which leaves very little for any other kind of expenses and there's no emergency. Um, so, and this is an infographic inside that building, how just this lack of homes that there are, lack of affordable homes for people. And we did it physically again and thinking about the lack was shown through these holes, like it's just not there. Um, the second home, this is a view of the second home and it was focused on the people involved. And unfortunately women are the ones facing eviction more, more often than not. And um, there's a quote on the inside of this building where Matthew Desmond says that, you know, for women, from African-American men, they're getting locked up and African-American women are getting locked out. Um, that's just when you look at the numbers, it's really um, disheartening. In the background, you see the building one where it's the income and the and people's rents just not matching up. So this by like the paint going over, the wallpaper is getting submerged in the paint. And then just another physical infographic that we did was about how many buildings are being sold to people who don't actually live in them. So landlords are making money still, no matter what landlords make money, even when people are evicted. And we did the, the infographic with doorknobs, just wanted to use something that was like quotidian and like felt really familiar, but then presenting this sort of heartbreaking information. Um, this is in the second room with the final, the third and the fourth buildings. The third building was about the process, the legal process, and it was completely closed up. You couldn't get into this building at all. Or you could just look through one window. And there was a video about people going through the legal system. Um, and then we had another infographic on the side, just simple data visualizations. But when you see it large, it has an impact. And then the fourth building was about people in the process of being evicted. So it was a photographer who had gone around and documented people in Milwaukee around the time that uh, Matthew had written the book. Um, and so this building was, this house was the most deconstructed of all, sort of blasted apart. Um, so, and then here you are looking back through into the first building to the last. And so this was a really great project for us to work on because it was something really to sink our teeth into and it was a great collaboration between the building museum and Sandra, the architect and ourselves. And it was up for a year and now it is actually currently traveling. It started in Milwaukee um, in the beginning of 2020 <laughs> and it is now currently in Nebraska. Um, so it's gonna be going around the country. Um, so now I'm just going to show you one other project that we are working on with the National Building Museum. This was, it's called The Wall on Euro, and it's about the border wall, and it was supposed to open up in April 2020, so it all got on hold. Um, so I have no finished pictures to show, I just thought you might be interested in showing, seeing some of our process. Um, every project starts with research, so we're looking at images of border crossings looking at current existing data visualizations about the border. Um, one showing like where the border is being built with orange going up. Uh, the bottom one is death along the border. And then the top one is just number of people crossing certain crossing points. Um, this is an artwork that's going to be in the exhibition. An artist did this piece about all of the border barrier separating nation states around the world, just so you can see where they are. And I think the US is the longest. Yes, it is. Um, and the curator spent a bunch of time going down to the US-Mexican border. And these are images that she took in California where the wall reaches the ocean and actually goes into the ocean. <laughs> um, this was really influential for us being how the wall here is being constructed, these pillars which are being painted on and how 
the sort of the messaging sits on some individual pillars that then goes across a couple to create bigger images. Um, so Sandra's working on the floor plan. What we do is she takes the floor plan and figures out where all of the content is going to sit. And meanwhile, we're having conversations about how to shape the narrative, where um, art is going to go, where infographics is going to go. Um, these yellow dots are these like pressure points that we're imagining that we're going to design. They're thresholds where you walk through and the, the ceiling gets lower. It gets like colored a bright color. There's like a light bulb right above your head and there's like a question on the wall. So these moments of reflection where you're really pressed in to sort of evocative of those water point moments where you cross through um, and reflection moments. Um, this is the identity. So this is the fun stuff when it gets to graphic design. Um, it, the whole show is going to be dual language, two languages. Um, and so this was completely done. And then we're working on the elevations now. And so you can see how these gray strips are little splat or slats, like eight inch slats. That are evocative of the wall itself from those photos in California. And we're going to have the title sort of wrap over them the way the graphics wrap over the existing wall. And so it's going to have a little bit of a lenticular feel to it. You can see this threshold moment that you're going to walk through. Um, there are these big bays in the museum, and we're going to put large images in there of the border um, just to show the different terrain you cross. It's mountains, it's desert, it's water. And then we're also inverting them to instead of they're black and white, but we're also inverting it. So it has this sort of uncanny feeling. There's something that is wrong. This, this territory, this land that has become this contested territory. Um, we are also doing prototyping. Uh, these are mock-ups of the flats. The HE is part of the, so it's going to be really big. You can see it's fun to test out and see. Uh, this is a mock-up we're doing. These are, uh, it's going to be a graphic about deaths uh, along the border, and each of those white dots is where someone died, and we're going to be nailing, putting the nails in where each of those is. And this is going to be a, um, <clears throat> a monitor with an animated data visualization showing how the buildup of the border happens, and the border is sort of a mentality of the country itself. It's not just along the US-Mexican border. It's this, it's all of the airports, it's all of the seaports, it is the DEA offices, um, the customs, sanctuary cities. Um, so everything is gonna, it's animated, so it builds up as you go along. Um, so that's it from my side. I'm gonna pass it back to Alicia to talk about another side project because sort of what we wanted to show was how our work with clients then feeds off other ideas so we spring out and have time to work on other things and then that feeds back to the mm -hmm. well it's also that sort of the um, sort of the myth of having your own studio with infinite flexibility to you know go see movies in the middle of the day that's you know true uh, but you don't often do it because you're too busy working so uh, this was a project that we managed to carve out, uh, you know, between projects or, you know, just sort of something that was interested in me and sort of capitalized on a specific moment. So um, I wrote a book called This is What Democracy Looked Like uh, about the history of the printed ballot, uh, specifically um, this, but not this at all. Um, this is what we may know of as our, oops, uh, oh, sorry. as our ballot. Um, but when I first started reading about early voting practices through an article in The New Yorker, I was sort of intrigued by the, the mention that they were colorful, which started this whole kind of recreational research uh, endeavor where I found though that in the past, you know, ballots used to look like this from 1864 or this next one, which was pretty amazing from 1878. These are very close up views. Uh, and then you have this kind of curvy one from 1865. Uh, and this one, which is one of my favorites from 1870. So yes, these were all ballots, um, which led me to sort of, you know, an incredibly 
fascinating journey into our history as a nation, which I was never, I was, you know, keen on history, but not a huge history buff and learning about how the ballot as an object, as a tool of democracy really reflected the nexus of so many different aspects of voter suffrage and also like print production evolution. So that you see the next slide, you know, there were um, ballots that were on colorful paper Back then, it was never a private act. It was always a public display of your allegiance. And each party printed their own ballot. So there was a multitude of different pieces of paper to submit to a box. Um, or you got samples like these uh, pre-print, pre-cut uh, gang sheets, which you can see uh, from North Carolina, um, the different typographic variations within that. Uh, anyway, so just in short, uh, you know, this was a talk that I gave in at typographics as well. And, you know, the publisher was uh, really wanted to hit 2020. And so this is the book. You can get it, uh, hopefully not at Amazon, but at your local bookstore um, called um, This is What Democracy Look Like. And then happily in October before the old general election, um, I got a lot of nice support from Cooper Union, which is where Sarah and I both teach as well, uh, occasionally, and they were able to put it in their windows. Uh, we had plans for it to be in a gallery, but this ended up being much more, um, you know, public facing and socially distant, and the proportions of the window were very friendly to ballots. Uh, so this is my husband on a bicycle uh, filming the array of um, of windows that were, I was happy to fill with larger scale versions of all of the many, many samples that I found uh, in the research. So uh, again, this is sort of trying to just show that, you know, within practice, it can encompass many different aspects of, of working for others, working for yourself and uh, working just to sort of um, satisfy an intellectual itch. So I think that concludes our images, right? Is that the end? That is the end. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.